Well, this is most of Christianity, most of Judaism. Remember, Judaism came out of Egypt. Even if you take the basic idea of Judaism, they were there in Egypt uh, for 200 years or some say 400 years, depending on which text you read. They would have uh, understood everything about Egypt. Remember that uh, Joseph, him of the coat of many colors, became the prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. You don't become second only to Pharaoh if you don't understand all of the Egyptian language, Egyptian culture, and Egyptian religion. And remember when, uh, was it, um, oh, it was Joseph who married Potipar, the um, daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis, with his coat of many colors, it's pretty obvious that he was a priest of Egypt as well. He would have understood everything Egyptian. And so there would have been a deep Egyptian flavor within the Israelites as they left Egypt on the Exodus. So it's not surprising that there were a lot of commonalities between Egyptian religion and the evolving uh, Judaic religion, which then evolved again, obviously, into uh, Christianity. And one of those aspects, of course, would have been the chief later deities of uh, Egypt. So we're talking sort of 18th dynasty onwards, which was Osiris, Isis, and Horus. That was the original trinity. And they were famous throughout Egypt, venerated throughout Egypt. And the female aspect was a large part of Egyptian religion, as it is today. Um, the female runs the family. They bring up the next generation. The female likes the female di uh, deities. And so Isis was one of the biggest uh, goddesses or even gods within Egypt, within the later Roman Empire, um, not so much in the Greek Empire, but certainly throughout the uh, Levant, uh, one of the biggest venerations with the most temples was Isis. And the imagery was always of Isis carrying her infant son, Horus. So Isis was, well, she was the moon. She was also Venus because later on she became Venus. Um, Isis was not called Isis in Egypt. Her name was Ast. So our name Isis is a Greek rendering of, of the original Egyptian. So she was Ast. And um, in the East, which is why I think a lot of Eastern religion, uh, Persian Parthian religion, came from Egypt and not vice versa. There are some people that say everything began, you know, in, in Babylon. I don't think that's true. I think it started in Egypt and moved across to Babylon. So Isis, when she went to the east, she became Ashtoreth, she became Astarte. You can hear the name Astarte, Ast was Isis. Um, and then she moved up into Greece, she became Aphrodite. Uh, they changed the name there because Aphrodite means the foam of the sea. Which might sound a bit odd. What's the foam of the sea? Why does it have anything to do with Venus? or even the moon come to that. You have to think of everything, everything that's said in these religions, you have to think of it in terms of the cosmos. Okay, so we're not talking foam of the sea. Don't, you know, stop thinking about beaches and, you know, Caribbean beaches with palm trees and, you know, soft waves. That's not what we're talking about. Foam of the sea, cosmos. We're talking about the Milky Way. The Milky Way is the foam of the sea. And so uh, Aphrodite, as Venus, was born in the foam of the sea. And from that, we can start dating, you know, what her uh, original dates were, because, you know, Venus is only present within the Milky Way for, you know, certain months within the year. So that's why she got a name change to Aphrodite. And then, of course, uh, the Romans called her Venus because she was identified with the star Venus, the planet Venus. Um, but her imagery was always Isis and Horus. Uh, 
And that imagery was so prevalent within the Roman Empire that, well, what could Christianity do about it? It couldn't delete this imagery and this veneration of Isis and Horus. So it just adopted it. And it called it Madonna and Child. And it literally just take this, took the same imagery and adopted it into Christianity and just said, oh, that, that's, that's Mary the mother. And that's how they changed the uh, religion into what we know as Christian uh, uh, beliefs and religion. And if, if you go to the um, uh, Pantheon in Rome, there is a wonderful uh, statue there of uh, Madonna and Child. But if you look at it, it's not the Madonna and Child at all. It's Isis and Horus. It's an original statue of Isis and Horus from second century or whether, whenever. And they've just adopted it and changed it, changed the headdress a little bit and called it Madonna and Child because it is the same imagery. You've got to remember Christianity came out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. We'll go into this maybe in a later talk. Uh, about the origins of uh, of Jesus himself. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Judaism came out of Egypt. Christianity came out of Egypt. Um, Jesus in, himself came out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. So you'll see very strong Egyptian imagery within Christianity that has been taken, adopted, changed a little bit, made it more, as it were, Christian, but it's still very much the same sort of belief system. You know, if you want to find the Queen of Sheba um, in the historical record, <laughs> you're not going to do very well starting with the name Sheba because that's a title. So you don't know her proper name. She was just called that because she was Isis. This happens quite a lot with uh, all of these characters. We get a lot of titles in their names and therefore you don't necessarily know immediately what their name is. Um, because all you have nowadays is the title. It's like Moses. Uh, Moses is not a name. Well, it's part of a name, I suppose. It's just, uh, it, it means born of. And so when we get Tuth Moses in Egypt, Ra Moses, Ar Moses, it's an Egyptian <clears throat> name. It just mean, means born of. Forget the... Um, uh, biblical translation, it means born of in Egyptian. So born of Ra, born of Thoth, born of Ah, the moon god. It just means born of. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what we don't get is we don't get who he was born of, which god he is the son of. Um, and for that, we have to go back to Manetho, who was a, a, an Egyptian historian from third century BC. And Manetho gives us the answer because he gives us the parallel story of the Moses Exodus story, but from a secular viewpoint, from an Egyptian viewpoint. And he says that Moses was called uh, Osasef, which means the son of Osiris. Seph is the same as Moses. It's the same name. It just means son of just as Moses means son of. So when he says that Moses was called Osasef, he was called the son of Osiris, which is a typical Egyptian name, the same as any pharaonic name um, and or army commander name, because if you look into Josephus Flavius, again, we have several books and sources we can use for this. We don't just have to use the Old Testament. Um, Josephus Flavius, who is Judaism's greatest historian, he comes from the first century, he wrote his own version of the Old Testament, which he took from a much older uh, Torah than the one we have today. He took it from the Babylonian Torah of at least the sixth century BC because he took the books from the Temple of Jerusalem uh, when the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. So he had some very, very, very early manuscripts to work from. And he wrote a, you could call it a secular version of the Old Testament, taken from these very old manuscripts.
And so he tells exactly the same story, but it's different in some respects. And one of the differences is that he says that uh, Moses was the Egyptian high army commander. He was the commander of the Egyptian army. And he led the battle against the Nubians. Uh, this would have been mm, probably 14th century BC, 13, 13 something BC. He led the battle against the Nubians at this time. <clears throat> And he defeated the Nubians, and he married the uh, Nubian queen, who was called Thabis. So the first wife of Moses was called Thabis, and she was a Nubian. And uh, she and her courtiers went up into Egypt um, to be with, with Moses. So there is a different story. But it's a different story that gives us more information it comes from a book that predates the present Torah. So it's more authoritative than the current Torah. And it gives us in many respects a more believable story because Josephus doesn't put all of the uh, spiritual aspects in it. It's, it's pretty much just uh, history. And so we get this different alternate perspective on these biblical type events, which is interesting the new establishment of Christianity didn't like its origins. Just as Judaism didn't like its origins as being Egyptian and therefore demonized anything to do with Egypt. Uh, if you look at um, uh, some of the later books within the uh, Old Testament, they demonize anything to do with Egypt to cover up essentially the fact that they were in Egypt themselves, they were Egyptians themselves. We'll go into this later. Um, Christianity wanted to do the same with its origins. Its origins didn't really conform to the um, creed that they had created. Could you talk to us about the origins of the symbol of the dove? that is used in Christianity. Yes, that's interesting. They, they, the Christians started using uh, and adopting the dove um, as a symbol of, the symbol of the, the presence of God, I suppose you could see it. You often see it in, in stained glass windows and so on in churches with the dove and, and rays of light coming out of, of the dove. Um, Yes, it's a very interesting symbolism. Uh, and again, it, it has a sort of surface meaning and a deeper meaning, of course, uh, as does everything within Christianity. Why the dove? The dove is a Jonah. Uh, that's what it means in Aramaic. It's, it's a Jonah. And this is where I've, I first got it. Well, I suppose I saw the symbolism straight away in a way. But um, we have the story of Jonah going into the ocean being three days under the sea in the underworld and then being born again, as it were, uh, three days later when he uh, ends up on dry land again. It's very much like Egyptian theology, the movement of the sun. <clears throat> and Jonah is the dove. So it's a dove going into the sea and then being born again after three days. It's very much like the diurnal religion of uh, the Egyptians, the movement of the sun. And that's what they've adopted. So one of the traditional symbols of Egypt was the flying sun disk. And you'll see the flying sun disk on, on the top of any temple, on the entrance to the temple. Always the greatest thing is the flying sun disk of Ra. Ra was the great god. Okay, he was changed by Akhenaten a bit later on, and he wasn't called Ra, he was called the Arden. But over the top of every temple, you will see the flying sun disk, the disk of the sun with the huge great wings of a, almost a vulture, I would say, not even an eagle, but a vulture. And so you've got this image of the flying sun because it flew across the skies. 
later on within Egyptian theology, of course, it was taken in a boat and you have this boat that goes across the skies. And then, of course, in, in Greek religion, they have exactly the same, but the sun god is now in a chariot being pulled by four horses across the skies. It's the same symbolism. Um, but Christianity, as far as I can see, is pretty obvious that they took this symbolism of the flying sun disk, but they didn't, they wanted to de-Egyptianize it. They didn't want to be associated with Egypt. No, we're nothing to do with Egypt. Our religion's got nothing to do with Egypt. I know Jesus came out of Egypt, but um, it's nothing to do with Egypt. And so we can't have a flying sun disk as an image of the God. But maybe we can have a, um, a dove. Because, you know, a dove is sort of peaceable. It's, it's no longer aggressive like a big vulture. Um, and so we'll have this dove with rays of sunlight coming out of the dove. And that's exactly what you get. You look at most cathedrals, you will find a dove with rays of sunlight coming out of it, exactly as happens in Egypt with the um, flying sun disk of Ra, exactly the same as you see with Akhenaten, with his sun disk. OK, it's not flying for him, but the sun disk with the rays of the sun coming out of the sun disk. And Christianity has adopted the same symbolism they just won't admit it they won't admit that that is an image of the sun as being the you know the primary deity god himself they won't admit it but they'll still portray it in every cathedral and there's a great one actually in saint peter's if you look in saint peter's at the back of the altar you will see a sunburst you can't describe it in other any other fashion there's a huge great sunburst with a dove in the center being Ra, the sun, the Aten. Um, and, and, and we know that all of this came out of Egypt because uh, if you go back into the uh, Torah, the sun disk of Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten, was called the Aten, or it was called the Aden. That was the sun disk for Pharaoh Akhenaten. And if you look at the God names for God within the Old Testament, you'll find he's called Yahweh. Everybody knows that one. El, Elohim, Shaddai, and Adon. So the God of the Jews is actually called the Adon, exactly the same as the sun disk of Akhenaten. <clears throat> This history flowed out of Egypt, of course. The Jews were in Egypt. That's where they came from. Uh, Akhenaten was something to do with this early Judaism. We'll go through this later. He was the first monotheist, the same as Moses and maybe Abraham. Um, there is a link here between the religion of Akhenaten and what became Judaism. Uh, read um, there's a famous book, um, Moses and Monotheism, by uh, Freud, the, the great um, uh, psychiatrist, was he? Freud? I don't know what his profession was. He was a psychiatrist, wasn't he? Uh, he wrote Moses and Monotheism, linking Pharaoh Akhenaten to early Judaism. And he wrote that, obviously, back in the 30s or something. Um, and that's been expanded on by many people, including myself, ever since, that there is distinct links between the religion of Akhenaten and the emerging religion of Judaism, which came out of Egypt. And so it's not surprising that we see all these similarities um, between these, these different religions. The answer is fairly simple. It's because the biblical God is, is pagan. Remember that the, basis, the basic thesis that we're developing here throughout all of these talks is this um, religion came out of Egypt. So Judaism came out of Egypt, Christianity came out of Judaism. And when Judaism came out of Egypt, it took many aspects of the Egyptian theology with them. Uh, as we said before in a previous talk, you don't get people like Joseph, who was the prime minister of Egypt, uh, and probably the high peace priest of Heliopolis. You don't get him in that high position if he doesn't uh, 
speak Egyptian, write Egyptian, understand G Egyptian theology and culture, and be thoroughly Egyptianized himself. And you can see that from those links and the many other links that we'll give as well with the Exodus and other events, the ancient uh, Judaism was steeped in Egyptian theology. I mean, that's why the Egyptian, uh, sorry, the is the Judaic God is called the Arden. Okay, so the, the Judaic God has many names. He was called uh, Yahweh, of course, El Elohim. Uh, he was called Shaddai. He was also called the Arden. And the Arden was the God of Akhenaten. So you can see the God of Akhenaten was called the Arten or the Arden. And you can see that they've brought this information out of Egypt. Uh, I mean, there are several of the ancient um, texts have found their way into biblical texts. So if you look at the Joseph plot, um, Joseph, him of the coat of many colors, co colors uh, that really comes from the tale of two brothers which is an ancient Egyptian text. Uh, the Ten Commandments comes from the judgment of the dead. Walking on water comes from the instruction of uh, uh, Um The Lord's Prayer essentially comes from the maxims of Annie. Uh, the Psalm 104, the famous one that people can look up, Psalm 104 comes from the hymn to the Aten, the god Akhenaten. Uh, Proverbs 22.20 comes from the instructions of Amen and Mopet, and it's called the same. It's called the 30 chapters, the 30 sayings. So you can see a lot of what we consider Judaism has actually sprung out of Egypt. And <clears throat> a lot of the gods came from there as well. So, yeah, the Judaic god was called Yahweh. Yah is the Egyptian moon. So Yahweh is the moon god. Elohim is the sun god. Uh, Shaddai is, comes from Seth, the god of war and storms. Um, as we said previously, uh, David and Solomon built temples to many gods, including the gods of Egypt. Uh, Makatema worshipped an idol, which was a priapus. It was a phallic symbol. Um, and she would have been, of course, one of the uh, one of the descendants of King David. Uh, Jeremiah, in if you look at the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is continuously admonishing the people for worshiping the Queen of Heaven. All the way through the book of Jeremiah, who's the Queen of Heaven? She's Isis. And so the Jews at that time, we're talking here, 6th century BC, when they were escaping from Jerusalem during the uh, Babylonian invasion, uh, they were worshipping Isis. So, yes, it's um, the ancient history of Judaism is steeped in uh, what people would call pagan gods, but they were just cosmic deities, um, astrotheology. So why are there so many similarities between, you know, the ancient cosmic gods and the biblical God? Well, because the biblical God has come out of these pagan roots. If you go back into its ancient history, 2000 BC, 1500 BC later, all of what we call Judaism today has come from these ancient roots. They changed the religion into monotheism, but that didn't happen until the um, reforms of Akhenaten, who was the first of the monotheists. We're talking there about 1320 BC. And he started the change from polytheism into monotheism. But that was not complete within Judaism until the sixth century BC. So it took 600 years to change Judaism from a polytheistic religion into a monotheist religion. And it's sort of been monotheist 
ever since. But of course, you, you've you've got a dozen gods who have been forced together into one monotheist god, and of course, that causes problems. There are bulges and wrinkles where all of these gods don't quite fit into the monotheism of later Judaism. And that shows itself as all of these inconsistencies with the names of their god, etc. So, yeah, we, we are worshipping an ancient pagan god or gods that have been changed over the centuries, over the millennia.